on this computer. Welcome everyone to another session of the data learning seminars. Today we have Lars Speholt from Google DeepMind. He's currently a staff research engineer and he, his talk will be about weather forecasting with deep learning, a paradigm chef. Lars, uh, thank you so much for um, sharing your time with us. And um, yes, please go ahead. Thanks. Um, yeah, I'm happy that I can speak at your seminar. Um, and yeah, as mentioned, I'm going to talk about weather forecasting, which I worked on uh, for three years-ish. Um, so just a little bit quick rundown of my background. I started in Aarhus University in Denmark. When I finished that, I went to DeepMind in London for um, three and a half years. Then together with some colleagues, I established uh, a Google Brain office in, um, in Amsterdam. Uh, like this year, I moved back to Denmark and now as you may have seen, Google Brain and Google DeepMind has merged. So now it's called Google DeepMind. Uh, and throughout my career, I like, wor worked on like a bunch of deep learning topics, right? So like machine translation, uh, language modeling, uh, in particular reinforcement learning. But in the last few years, I've worked on weather forecasting. And, and this is really joint work with people from Google Research and now uh, Google from, um, from Google um, DeepMind, people from Google DeepMind. And, and the purpose of weather forecasting, just to like reiterate like what, what we are talking about here is like, the, the first thing you, you may be interested in is just like day-to-day -day planning. Is it, do, do I need an umbrella uh, for going to the park or is, is it sunny and so on? Can I go to the beach uh, and, and so on? So that's like one purpose and what most users use it for. But then you could also use it for like optimizing the energy grid. So you can stabilize it by predicting solar and wind farms. And by doing so, you also optimize the grid um, and like reduce the, um, the dependency on coal power plants, for instance. You can do the same thing for food production, uh, how much water you need to uh, spray on the fields and so on, and, and when you can harvest, etc. And yeah, if, if the fourth thing here is like uh, urban livability. So basically predicting air quality, traffic and so on. And maybe like very relevant these days is like extreme events. So with like short term forecasting, we can prevent the loss of lives in like forest fires, floods, tornadoes and so on. And really this is like more important than ever, right? So, you know, we had Floods in Germany in 2021, we had a drought in 22, forest fires and so on, right? And, and Europe is actually probably one of the best places to be. Um, so it's even more extreme elsewhere. Um, so first I will go through the traditional methods for weather forecasting. Um, and there's really been like three main uh, methods. So for very short-term forecasting, basically less than three hour forecasting, people have used extrapolation. So basically very basic methods like optical flow. Then when we go into the multiple hours and days regime, we use like numerical weather prediction models, which are really like physics simulations. And then when you're beyond that, it's, it's, it becomes statistics and uh, um, climate specific. And these like numerical prediction models, that's the majority of the models that are currently in use today. And they work by basically splitting in the earth in these like 3D cubes, which are often like somewhere between uh, uh, three and, and 20 kilometers roughly. And you also have them vertically. So it's, it's like a 3D grid. And then you basically do some approximations of the physics interaction between these cells and simulate that into the future. And actually, if you look at the history of those, the, the accuracy has really like increased quite significantly, uh, especially for the Southern hemisphere. So the, the bottom lines here are the so Southern hemisphere where the Southern hemisphere is really caught up with the Northern. There's basically, well, one, one reason is uh, the use of satellites these days instead of just like local radar and so on. Um, but you also see that 
it kind of stagnates a bit, the progress. There's definitely still improvements, but 10 days forecast are not really that useful. Uh, and the challenges there is really like, the physics are really just approximations, right? And then even the initial conditions you start out the physics simulations with are imprecise. Uh, the resolution is pretty bad. And if you want to increase the resolution, you, you end up in a situation where um, it's, it's basically cubic in, in the resolution. And then you also have the last point here, which is these systems are like very custom engineered systems with many different components. Um, so that doesn't really scale anymore. So going back to this plot, we would really like to see machine learning be basically the, the method to um, exceed all the methods. Maybe the climate uh, forecasting is a bit tricky. There's no data really. But there are definitely people working on that as well. The reality is probably that machine learning is right about here. So we can definitely, at the hour scale, machine learning is the way to go. Uh, numerical weather prediction models still have, have a case for multiple days, uh, but it's like rapidly changing. So going into a MedNet a neural weather model, which is really what our work is, is about, um, we asked the question, like, what is the probability of a given amount of precipitation occurring at a specific location of time? That's really what we want to answer for the initial research we did uh, roughly three years ago. Uh, and precipitation is kind of interesting. The nice thing about precipitation is that you really have like a very dense map of the targets and, and inputs. Uh, so that's quite nice. Uh, the tricky thing is that, as you can see, it's like very, you know, discrete and it has like wind, it's like moving. And these patterns can like be created like out of nowhere, basically. Uh, as like this plot is showing, you have like a lot of like different types of precipitation and, and uh, fix, uh, like things that affects the precipitation. Um, and what we want to get out of this is, is a distribution, like the probability of a given uh, like millimeter amount um, in an hour. Um, and the way that numerical weather prediction models get this, this answer is really that they take a bunch of observations, then they have this data simulation step, which is basically taking all the sparse observations and like densifying them into like a, a full state. And then they run this simulation of that state the interactions of, of these like cubes, as I mentioned, like many times. Um, so it could be 50 times. And then finally you ensemble these uh, forecast, exact forecast or rollouts. Uh, and with that, you could do make like a probabilistic or deterministic forecast. And sometimes you'll even have like experts in the loop, right? So when you have like more extreme events, you will have experts looking at these forecasts to determine uh, the quality, which is a quite quite a strange thing to have, I think. We have, for MetNet, it's really just you know standard deep learning. We take it, observations in, you get a direct probabilistic output out. Another way to look at it is in this plot here. So we have the numerical weather prediction where you have the initial conditions x, but you then perturb these uh, conditions. So you have like an, a set x of uh, conditions you start out with, and then you run the simulation and you end up with some basically ensemble that you're merging into a distribution. Where again, with deep learning, we can predict the distribution directly with the single forward pass. So some really nice things about uh, using deep learning for forecasting is that these traditional models take an hour or more, it could be up to six hours actually for some of the models. So it's not really useful for like short-term forecasting. That's why we have been using optical flow and they're actually also like very poor quality in the beginning. Where neural networks are quite efficient and they're highly scale, uh, paralyzable. So we can really run this in like one second when we have the data, if you're paralyzed enough. Another thing is the resolution. So MedNet has like a two minute temporal resolution and a one kilometer spatial resolution where the NVPs, they have approximately one hour 
temporal resolution. In this case, there's a model called HER and a spatial resolution of three kilometers, which is basically the best you can get. Um, we can also, with neural network, it's quite easy to model a lot of things at the same time. So of course, we can use like standard variables like precipitation, wind, temperature, and so on. But we could also model like tornadoes directly and get a probability of the tornadoes as long as we have enough uh, annotated data. Uh, and we can do this with like variables where the physics are not well understood. Uh, and NVPs cannot really do that. Finally, and this is really the, the, the essence of machine learning and in particular deep learning, we have transfer learning, right? So every new variable we ask the model to predict has the potential for improving the model across the board for all the other variables as well, if there's some um, similarity between them. Every input has the potential for improving any output, right? And finally, as with the deep learning we've seen, you know, any improvement in the community for even language modeling or vision and so on has the potential to improve the results. So the progression here of, um, of METNA was that in first in 2020, we, we published the first paper where we did uh, um, succeeded this baseline we had, it was a quite strong baseline for seven, eight hours. In 2021, we were exceeding for 13, 15 hours, and now we're exceeding for 24 hours plus. Um, so going a bit into detail about MITNA 3, which is really about stronger results compared to MITNA 2 and including more variables. But starting off with precipitation again, um, want to mention these baselines that we're comparing to. So we're comparing with the US-based model over the continental US, uh, which is a deterministic one. So it, it has only one rollout. And we have one called HREF, which is an ensemble. HRES, which is a global deterministic high quality model from the European Institute. And then ENS, which is similar to HRES, but uh, an ensemble where you have like 50 ensembles that you combine. And then finally, MedNet, which on, you know, the frequency and so on is, is much better. We can run it every 10 minutes or even two minutes. Technically, the spatial resolution is high and the temporal resolution. However, when we compare weather models, like really the, the thing you really want to compare with is something like actual weather or weather.com and so on, which uh, are based on these models and a bunch of other models, and then they're post-processed. So the results we have here, uh, we have we are measuring using two metrics, CRPS, which is really measuring the entire distribution of all rates, and then CSI, which is taking the probabilities and thresholding them, uh, and then those are for individual uh, uh, rates. So for CRPS, which is like lower is better, we are better than uh, this ENS, the strongest baseline for all of 24 hours. For one millimeter CSI, we're better for like 16 hours. And then when we go to like eight millimeter, which is higher rates, we're actually better for more than 24 hours. Um, initially, like when we did our first research, people were thinking, oh, we, we only published like two millimeter results up to two millimeter, and they were like, yeah, you should try higher rates, that's much harder. But actually, like relatively speaking, we're doing better with higher rates. And we have like one visualization here, which is 24 hours. So up here, we have the ground truth for one millimeter rain, where we have one millimeter rain. And down here, we have the probabilities. So uh, um, green is a higher probability and yellow is a lower probability down to 1%. And then we have the blue line here, which is the threshold that optimizes the CSI um, score, but really like the probabilities is, is what you want. But the nice thing about here is that we, we actually predict like a full formation of a new precipitation pattern, which is also something that people initially thought these models would never be able to do. They thought they were only going to be extrapolating or like moving around the precipitation, but this is really not the case at this point. Um, we also, in the MEDNET 2 paper, we did an analysis using integrated gradients 
of what this model learns. And we found that this, the model is actually consistent with one of the theories that people learn at the university about weather forecasting. So that's a quite nice small things. And like we also did uh, uh, attribution, input attribution where like the center patch, of course, where we have our target, I'll come back to that, is where the attribution is highest, uh, but it's not just like the center point. We are actually using the entire context. Um, there are like a bunch of papers that compare the data on not MMS, which is like a, a radar-based precipitation, but on era five, which is a reanalysis data set. So it really only comes out like days after the actual events. Um, and what we found is like, we believe like MMS is the best ground truth and era five is actually quite different from the ground truth. So, and, and era five cannot really be used for productionization or like, operational models. So we think people should use something else than era five. And you see the resolution is much lower. The precision is lower. So, yeah. So the other point about the uh, MedNet 3 was surface variables. So temperature, dew point, wind speed, and so on. And um, the problem with that compared to the precipitation, which is measured by radar, is that these variables are measured by, mostly by weather section. It is actually possible to, to measure wind uh, in a more like dense fashion. But the high precision is really from weather station. And what we show here is like a thousand high precision weather station across the US. The green points here are our training stations and the blue points here are the ones that we have as a holdout set, which is 20% of the data. Um, so what we do is that like, like basically we want the model to forecast a dense prediction, right? You want the weather, like no matter which location you're in and just not, not just by zip code and something like that. So what we do is that we use dropout. So for every training run, we mask out the number of the input stations. And this means our model will generalize to, um, to inputs where there's no, or like locations where there's no weather station. So we evaluate using like a holdout set, as I mentioned. So that's symbolized here uh, with all of the inputs, of course, with no dropout. And then we have a second type of evaluation, which we call hyperlocal evaluation, where we also use the evaluation stations as input. Um, and this is really just like, if you want to um, really make use of all the data and make use of the exact locations of the weather stations and what the quality would be in that case. And this is a, an example showing what we have. So these are the weather stations, the evaluation and the training stations. And our prediction, so these mountains here are the, um, the Rocky Mountains in Colorado. And we have this ENS, which has much lower resolution, but it's actually not the resolution which is bad here. It's really the like it's not it's not the resolution of you know, say the kilometers. It's it's more the model that actually generates a quite blurred uh, output, where we are much more precise. And there's mountains going up right here, uh, and down here we show the error per station, which is like significantly lower in this case, but of course it's handpicked. And the results on the in this case are much, much stronger. So it, we're way beyond like 24 hours. Again, like we do know that if you're compared with like actual weather, for instance, the results would be quite different as there's definitely a lot of uh, post-processing uh, needed for those mo for these models. Um, but again, this is, um, yeah, so the legend is missing here, but this is an ENS. Then we have um, the non-hyperlocal Midna 3 and the hyperlocal, both on CRBS, so that's like on the entire distribution and the uh, um, mean absolute error. And if you, if you look at like a single location for these models, one will also see that even though like ENS is these 50 ensembles, they actually don't 
like the probabilities don't spread have a lot of spread in them and where we here we are showing like an 80 percentile um visualization and like we have like a much more realistic spread than these like ens which is yeah the prediction the probabilities only come from running these 50 models and and combining the results in these 50 simulations so a few notes on the architecture. So basically what we do is that we take a 5,000 by 5,000 5, kilometer input. Uh, and this will be, so here we're looking at it uh, um, at a quite like a rough uh, uh, projection here, but this is like, of course, due to the curvature of the, the earth and the target area down here, which is 512 kilometers by 512. And then we do, uh, we merge multiple predictions together. And the input we use is a radar, which is called MMS, weather stations, elevation, coordinates, and these uh, topographical embeddings that we use, um, which is also basically based on the coordinates. And then her assimilation, which is uh, it's actually the input that these traditional models get initially. So they do have a lot of like very related variables. Uh, I think this one is like one we want to get rid of over time. So it'd be like a fully pure model that doesn't need that. But to do that, like we basically need like a lot of data sources, like raw data sources that are in this uh, input, the her simulation input. Uh, we also have like low resolution radar at a higher context, like 5,000 by 5,000 and satellites, which is like optical satellites also at like 5,000 by 5,000. And then the targets are precipitation using MMS and a cross entropy loss. Um, and there we, we predict the precipitation rate, but also like hourly accumulated precipitation. And then we have the surface variables, which is a slightly lower resolution. Uh, and that, there we have like six features as so temperature and wind and dew point and the well, two, two um, two components of wind, uh, humidity, and so on. And then we have the simulation her state, which is just for an auxiliary loss. But ideally, we'll also want to get rid of that. And the architecture is a little bit of a mix of, uh, of a lot of things. So on the outside is really like a unit-like model. So we have a four kilometer resolution where we have the inputs that are provided four kilometers. We have some input in the eight kilometer scale provided at the next stage. And then we go down to 16 kilometers and, and up sample again. Um, and finally, we predict the surface targets and the herd targets, herd simulation targets. And at the one kilometer scale, we predict the precipitation. And within this architecture, we do have uh, transformers, of course. That's what everybody uses these days. Uh, so we have used uh, specifically max width, like a, like a, a quite a modified max width, as well as like resonance blocks and so on. Um, and then one thing we do is that basically, like for our model to predict, let's say eight hours, we give it an index, like an eight hour index as an input, as it becomes like an embedding. Uh, and this we actually feed at basically every single stage of the model. So it's really conditioned like, throughout the model on um, the specific time it needs to forecast. And that's different from an early iteration where it was only provided as an input at the first, uh, first layer. And really these models, like they use more than 10 gigabytes of raw data per sample. And as we get more data sources, this will increase, increase quite massively. So for that, like we really need parallelism. Uh, so we use model parallelism on Google Cloud TPUs. Um, as you may be familiar with like Google Cloud 
TPU is like a customized accelerator. Uh, like these days, TPUs are also really customized towards machine learning, but this chip is like only for machine learning. Uh, and they're quite strong and competitive with the GPUs and cheaper. And these are connected in what's called TPU pods. It's like one V3 pod is more than 100 petaflops, and the new generation is even more than that. Um, and we use the JAX framework, so similar to, you, you could think about that as like accelerated NumPy basically with gradients. Uh, but it's quite fle flexible and much more, like much cleaner than let's say PyTorch in my opinion, and much more, uh, uh, if you like programming language stuff, that, that's, that's quite nice. Then we have this uh, framework Flex, which is a neural network framework on top of it, to make it very easy to use for neural networks. Uh, but basically, yeah, these two things are similar to PyTorch. And what we do is like we basically take the input and split it into a four by four grid. And then we have uh, 16 chips, each getting like one part of the input. And we throughout like, the network, they do all the, the communication between the chips. And finally, we have like a merged um, output. And all of this is done like very automatically. There's very few code changes needed. There's a little bit of metadata on, on how these dimensions should be sharded throughout the model, but that's it. And really it doesn't really take any, uh, um, it, it, it's basically linear scale with the number of chips. So going forward, it, our goal, as I mentioned, a little bit with the, the her input and her assimilation output. We really want to make like a model that basically goes like end to end on all of what So basically take all the raw data we can find and produce all the raw data for forecast of specific events as an output. So really like one global model, like earth model, you could say. So that's really the intention. And like really in the last, let's say two years, a lot of progress has happened also industry-wide. So the big players are all part of this. So Apple um, is definitely ramping up on weather forecasting as well. Uh, they acquired a company called Dark Sky, integrated that into the products. Microsoft is, is uh, also producing research on this topic and integrating that. And then we have a bunch of startups these days it was quite interesting to see the, the takes on both the climate and weather forecasts and so on. And finally, we have the traditional institute, ECMWF is like the European Institute and uh, NOAA is the, the US uh, Institute for weather, weather forecasting. Um, yeah, that was uh, basically what I had to, to tell you. So a little bit shorter than the expected 40 minutes, but Thank no, thank, yeah, thank you so much, Les, for your um, presentation. But in any case, we have like, I'm pretty sure we have lots of questions from the audience. Um, so thank you so much for sharing what you have done with MetNet3 and all of the algorithms. Um, if you have any questions for Les, um, just you can write it in the chat or you can just raise your hand and unmute yourself. There is a question in the chat. It says, is there any type of physical inductive bias in the model that ensures the model satisfies certain physical properties? By Nassim. Um, that's a good question. And the answer is no, we don't have anything. As I said, like we do have some input from these uh, phys physical models, but only really the initial state. So we don't have any, any bias in the model. Um, we do some small like custom tricks that doesn't really have anything to do with physics, but more with the overfitting. So it's like, even though we have a, lo a lot of data, like right now we're only using five years of data, and to not overfit on the later hours, we do some trick uh, to um, downweight like the later hours initially and so on. Uh, but no, we don't really have any physics priors. We do see that there's a lot of interest in that area, like some of our. Um, well, other people, other papers in the communities are using physics priors. 
um, and also some prior research by by DeepMind, for instance, Google DeepMind uses the same concept of numerical weather prediction model that you have to operate on a state that you keep rolling forward, uh, but we don't do that. Thank you. Uh, this one by Rosella, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Lassie, for the amazing talk. Uh, I was wondering about these, um, you said that obviously you are collaborating with the operational centers, but what, where do you see your uh, framework acting in the operational scenario, like couple, coupled with the existing operational systems or like trying to replace them? Yeah, that's also a good question. Um, so I think there's multiple and well, there are two answers to that question. So on the one side, you really just want like for let's say like having a forecast, you just want like the best forecast possible. Right? So in that case, you will take you could take like the which we have also done, of course, like take like all the forecasts of these traditional models and just see what comes out of that. And that is definitely like a, a result that is even superior to both of the models, which I think you will expect. Um, we did that in the middle two papers, so you can see the results there. Um, over time, we would like it to be the case that the gap between using all these forecasts as an input and not doing that will narrow so much that eventually we won't do that anymore. So I think from a pure research point of view, it's more interesting to eventually just use raw inputs and produce output from that without any uh, interaction with these like physics um, based map models. Okay, I see. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there's one in the chat by Pretty Yit. In one of your slides, you mentioned using GOAS satellite images. Did you pick any specific band of for precipitation forecasting, or did you take all the bands that the data came with so as to account everything possible? Yeah, so we use all of them, which is 16. There are like a few more bands that are not technical bands, but the like derivative bands, you could say, of the, let's say clouds and so on. Uh, but we just use those 16 bands. Yep, yeah, good, thank you. Um, sorry, I was gonna ask you, when you show in the results, um, the comparison for the wind speed and you have like a 24 hour lead time, is a compared to just, yeah, that one. Is it to com compare to like all, all the ensembles starting from which starting point? I was, I was in, um, maybe I missed that point. Oh, you're muted. Sorry. Yeah, so this one is showing the wind speed prediction from zero hours to 24 hours at one specific location. So this is really like a hand picked example, even though many of the exams are like this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, so, so uh, the blue band here is like Medna 3. And uh, the, the, uh, black band, uh, like the black line here is a, what we consider the ground truth from the weather station. And like this is like the um, the median plot and the 80 and 20%. I have to double check that actually if it's like 90 or 10%. Uh, now, yeah, but um, and this is the same for, um, for ENS. Okay. And then um... This is like during what time of the year? Like, um, that's a good question. I have that in the paper. Um, that is uh, June, so okay. June twenty-one. Yeah, I just wonder if like um the model is able to capture what happens around like maybe the hurricane season, for example. Or yeah, so, so I don't have a plot here with 
with all like the months, like we have produced a plot like that in um, in the MedNet 2 paper, I believe we actually have one of our samples is a, uh, a hurricane. Mm -hmm. uh, I have to double check that. But I, leave, but I believe we included a hurricane in MedNet 2. Where are we doing fine? Okay. Um, just checking now. Yeah, we have a, a part of the hurricane in, in the Bitnet 2 paper. Cool, thank you. Is that run like 2020 or a bit earlier? Um, the hurricane is from 2020. Okay. And as you mentioned, actually, that this research is uh, basically being published now. Okay. Yeah. Research, so potentially the paper will be out in potentially tomorrow. Okay, cool. Just looking it's forward to it. Um, in terms of like now that Google DeepMind, so Deep, Google Brain and DeepMind, they were um, merged. Um, I noticed that DeepMind released a paper, GraphCast, at the end of December last year. How, well, I don't know how much you can tell us, but how are these like efforts, individual efforts, you plan to put them together at some point? Or for example, with DJMR that was published like two years ago for Ray for Forecast in the UK. Yeah, so um, we merged with DeepMind uh, seven weeks ago. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, uh, as you can see in the paper author list, like we hadn't really collaborated uh, uh, until then, but obviously like now we are the same uh, company, we, sh we should uh, collaborate and uh, we are talking to them. So yeah, potentially we will uh, collaborate uh, over time. Like, I uh, like I, it's definitely the case that both like within Google Research and Google DeepMind, mm -hmm. there are like different beliefs in what I think is like the right approach. Okay. But um, yeah, you should definitely expect to see more collaboration. Cool. Um, yeah, there's another question from the chat from Pretty Eat it says, um, I see that there's quite a lot of input variables that were considered. In the study, did you focus perform ablation studies, such as finding which variables matter the most and which ones did not? Yes, we did that. Um, so let me find it here. So you can, uh, you can see this paper, right? Shared, yeah. Yeah, so in the MedNet 2 paper, in the supplementary material, there are some um, analysis of, of the variables. Uh, so this is like using this integrated gradients approach, as, as I mentioned. Uh, and this is like the impact of temperature as an input, uh, dew point as an input, and relative humidity and so on at, at different uh, pressure levels. So we do have some analysis. And yeah, what I showed regarding uh, uh, let's see. Um, yeah, what I showed regarding the um, the plot in the presentation about uh, what is important. Those. Uh, yeah, so these these plots as well. Uh, like we do also have some plots in the MedNet two paper on leaving out. For instance, uh, goes, I think it is. We also have some experiments in the first MedNet paper and leaving out some inputs. Uh, in the newest paper, we, we don't include that because it's not yeah, interesting in this situation. Thank you. It's okay, pretty good. Um, does anyone have any other questions for last in the chat or you can raise your hand? I think we still have some time for questions. Um, in the meantime, I was going to ask, um, the test case here is over the US. How easy will it be to expand this to other areas and maybe have less availability of data? Yeah, so yeah, another great question. So um, 
the, the tricky thing about weather forecasting, unless you use like the inputs from these MVPs like globally, right? As or like era five, as like the graph class paper and so on, is that there's a lot of data processing needed, right? So so the US is quite nice because uh, the US facilitates putting all this data online. So that's great. Um, Europe is reasonable. They are like we, the, Europe is, has like a bunch of countries and they don't, they're not like 100% aligned on this raw data. Um, but there are, of course, like you can use like these models from ESMWF, like ENS and so on. And then we, if we come to areas like Africa, India and so on, it's, it's much, much worse. Like in India, you, we do have some uh, radars measuring precipitation, for instance, but they're not very dense. Um, there are actually becoming more and more satellites online that try to measure these things. So, so one thing is like this ghost satellite, which is uh, optical bands, but also like infrared and so on, which to some extent you can use for measuring precipitation and clouds and so on, but it's not that great. Then you have satellites, there's some satellites called iMerge, or like a product called iMerge that comes from radar-based satellites. So those are not geostational. So basically they uh, rot rotate around the earth. There's a bunch of them, like seven or so, I think. Um, so you don't have precipitation measurement for all locations at all times, but it's, it's quite reasonable. However, the, the quality is like still way worse. Like the resolution is 10 kilometers, but even then you cannot really like 100% trust it. So locations where you don't have anything are quite, quite tricky. And I don't think that has been like fully solved yet. Um, yeah. Yeah, okay. But I feel like global missions or I guess it's like the radar the rain radar data adds, adds up a lot, of, adds a lot of information. Yeah, so I think we did some progress in this paper on tagging this. So basically there are like weather stations in these locations. They may just be like lower quality and not like official weather stations. Uh, and they may have like higher latency, but there's definitely some data around. It's just about, you know, gathering it and, and, and so on, right? So, yeah. And I was going to ask you like a, a question in terms of like, how do you feel about um, the role that maybe generative networks can play on maybe producing that data that we don't have in order to use the model that you provided? Or for example, DGMR uses um, GANs to generate the rainfall, but the, since then it's been a lot of like things with diffusion models or latent diffusion models. So I just wanted to like, if you can tell me about your views on using generative AI for this? Yeah, so I think like right now we don't have that, but I haven't seen any really good results from that. So yeah, there's the DeepMind paper, the DM, uh, was it, yeah, GR, yeah, like the GAN based paper, but they actually switched to GraphCast, right? Which is not based on GANs. Um, and then you, you could use diffusion to generate all these like rollouts and then combine and com combine it using ensembles. But then if you do that, like, isn't it better just to direct to predict the probabilities? It probably is. Uh, I see. Um, you could you could say that. So as I mentioned, like some of these like expert forecasters, they actually look at these like individual forecasts and then determine the quality or like the risk of a hurricane or like the location or like where a hurricane would strike. Um, but again, you know, why not just predict it? Why not just predict directly what is the probability of a hurricane or, you know, extreme wind at this location? Mm -hmm. So I think, well, right now, we are much more likely to continue with the direct distribution prediction. Okay. Yes. Yeah, yeah, because I guess the generation also adds a lot of uncertainty of what's being generated is um, real or not. Yeah, and uh, you also need quite a few samples potentially, right? So do, do you want to do generate like, let's say a thousand samples, like 50 is not enough, right? That's just what ESMWF and ENS does because that is like the cheap enough 
that you can do that, but basically they were like 500 or 5,000 or 5 million, right? So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, maybe it's just better to have like a more powerful model that predicts the distribution directly, but I'm not, you know, that, that's, we'll see what happens. Okay, yeah, cool. Um, any other questions in the chat for us? Um, well, if not, I have one final question, if that's okay. Uh, in terms of like Met, MedNet, MedNet 2, Met, MedNet 3, in terms of like inference times or how much computing power you need to run MedNet 3 compared to MedNet, um, is there any kind of um, evaluation of if the computing power used to run MedNet 3 compared to the increased like the increase in performance, does that make sense? Well, unfortunately, we're not in the same state as let, let's say like GPT, where you can keep training for quite some time. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's not the case that we can just can continue training and we'll get better results. So we are like this MedNet 3 model, we are trained for, for seven days. Yeah. And these, how um, much is it, like 100? to 256 chips so, so it is quite like a beefy model but not, not not compared to what is happening these days in the rest of the landscape and most yeah. of the you know most of the gain is really in the first day so it's not uh, extremely expensive um, but we would like to be in a place where it's all about just keeping training right and it's all about like uh, doing architecture changes and training um, but that's not the case right now like even, you know, like as I mentioned, we are using four or five years of data and we should be using more. You know, yeah. it's just a matter of like not having access to all the data. Um, it's quite limiting, right? You only see a handful of hurricanes. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's just not enough. Like it's like, so we, we cannot expect these models to do well on let's say one month time horizon or something like that with so little data right there's very few data points really um so yeah we need more data but there's a lot of data out there and you know like even these traditional approaches they don't use all the data they cannot process it um so yeah, yeah. especially like um, google earth engine is like really vast catalog of data sets you don't even know where to like start but yeah. like data like there's data available there to make um good models Definitely, yeah. Um, yeah, last question by Prithijit is, um, have you used G GFN, GFS forecasts that are produced by NOAA for precipitation or wind or my image dying? Yeah, that's it. We have not. Um, it would make sense to some extent, like the issue with GFS on this time horizon is that they are six hours delayed. Yeah, six hours delayed and lower resolution. So we are using her, right, the HIR. Uh, and that is also produced by NOAA, but it's higher quality on up to 48 hours. Mm. Um, so if you have that, it doesn't really make sense. And like ENS is higher quality than GFS. So we should use that instead. We have trained a hybrid model, as we call it, where we use like the forecast as input. Um, but eventually, you know, and again, as I mentioned, that gives us better results, but eventually we don't want to do that. Like we want it to be, you know, really about the scientific breakthrough of using deep learning and not relying on any of these forecasts before and just do post-processing. Cool. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, yep. Yeah, if there's no further questions, I think we can leave the talk up to here. Thank you last uh, again for sharing your um, amazing work with us and thank you everyone for attending today. Thank you. Have a nice day. Bye-bye. Have a great day. Bye-bye.